got him. Does this goat skin make me look big? Looks better on you than the previous owner. What? I'm having a hard time losing these last few pounds since bearing your children, and that's the best you can do? I look better than a goat? Thanks. Babe, you know you are the most beautiful woman on the planet. Mm. What? I'm the only woman on the planet. Well, I can't help that. You know, and it's amazing that as the only woman on the planet, you still can't seem to remember my birthday or give me flowers once in a while. Well, I did give you a rib. Oh, right. I forgot about that since you haven't mentioned it for an hour. It's like your free pass to never lift a finger for me again. Never lift a finger? I am out there busting my rear all day. Food just doesn't pop up from the ground. I have to get it with the sweat of my brow since someone went and got the ground cursed. You think farming's hard? Try raising those kids. Try giving birth. Well, if someone wouldn't have taken advice from a talking reptile. Oh, here we go. Are you talking to me, you little snake? What? Oh, jump off a bridge? Oh, I would, but they haven't been invented yet. Oh, eat this fruit? Well, you look like a pretty trustworthy snake. Nobody's perfect. Yeah, well, we were until you went and pretty much ruined it for all of mankind, so good job with that. I seem to remember you taking a bite, too. Well, I thought I was eating from the tree of the knowledge of restfulness and serenity. Right. It's never your fault. Besides, what was I going to do with a fallen wife? That would just be weird. Oh, you fell for me? You're an idiot. Idiot? I named every single animal. Right. Great job with that. A, a prairie dog's not a dog, a seahorse isn't a horse, and a bald eagle isn't bald. Well, I was going pretty fast. Aardvark? Platypus? Okay, they were at the back of the line. Not everything can be cat or rat or bat. Hippopotamus? Yeah, well, woman was taken. Okay, how many gorge do you have back there? That was a joke. Not good for men to be alone. <laughs> no, it's great. Well, good morning. Welcome to Open Arms. I wonder if that's what it was like for the very first argument. Makes us wonder, fill in the lines there in God's Bible, what's not said and what happened. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us together in your presence today. We ask that once again you would pour out your Holy Spirit and that you would draw us into your presence in a very special manner. Help us to worship you, Lord. Help us to honor you, Lord. And might we allow you to have absolute sway over our lives. And make us to be who you want us to be. Make us to be like Jesus. For we pray in his name. Amen. Just blood of Jesus. 
Please grab hold of that program you received this morning, please, and uh, reach inside and take the connection card out. Then grab one of those pens you find in front of you. We're going to take the next couple of moments to fill these out together. And then, as is our custom, we're going to come back to the card near the end of worship. And each one of us is going to be encouraged to take at least one next step in our spiritual journeys. And some possible next steps are outlined on the back of the card. So let's take the next couple of moments, please, to fill these out together. So our message is on vision today, and although it's not a bright, sunny day, we're going to see clearly, right? Okay. Right.
also found an envelope in your worship folder. If you'd like to make a financial gift to support God's work through open arms, I invite you to use the envelope and please put your name on it. You can read the announcements that are there. I just would highlight that the January Light and Life magazine, the Free Methodist publication, uh, is available. There's some on the table there. There's uh, some on the table if you go out that door. There's some on the microwave in the Welcome Center. Uh, I read the issue already and some great articles, uh, especially the article about Above All Else, Love God by our new bishop, uh, Linda Adams. And uh, I encourage you to grab a copy and read it. With that in mind, let's stand together then as we sing.
start the year one. Perhaps we've come in stumbling and fumbling and still trying to catch up from last year or, or we've launched ourselves into new, a new era, a new season of our lives. Our lives in, in this world, but more importantly, our lives in Christ. Perhaps you've spoken to us. Us. You're always watching out over your children. One of the passages that has spoken to my heart so repeatedly over the course of my time with you, Lord, is he who watches over Israel never slumbers and never sleeps. There's nothing that happens in the course of our lives, in the course of our days, our moment by moments, that, that you aren't already fully aware of and fully able but we forget that sometimes we allow the the climate of the day the things that are looming large on news networks and, and talking heads to cause us to become unsettled and stirred and there are things that should shake us up there are, we should be concerned about about some of the things that are going on and uh, across the face of this planet. But we should never lose sight. We should never lose track of, of the truth that you are in charge. Your hand is on the throttle. You're ready our brake. Are you taking care of the tiller? And with that in mind, Lord, what do we fear? great theologian, Mickey Rivers, once said, no sense wondering about things that I can't do nothing about. And if I can't do nothing about it, there ain't no sense worry about it. And if there ain't no sense worrying about things that I can't do anything about, or whichever one it was, because I've forgotten already about any of these. But if I can do something about it, then I can do something about it. So there ain't no sense worrying. So why worry? Help us to look up in these times of, of uncertainty and difficulty in, in our lives and the lives of, of the people that we love. To look to the hills. That place from which our strength comes. And to find our respite. And to find encouragement. To find the wherewithal journey alongside of one another, because really, isn't that what it is to be a part of the church? More than just having our, our ticket stamped for heaven, it's being here for one another, and being testimony to the nations round and about us, that's the communities, the neighbors, the county that we're a part of, the state that we're a part of, the nation that we're a part of, and that you are God. called us, you've placed your, your hand upon our lives, and you've made us your own in Christ. For that, Lord, we need to be so incredibly thankful this morning. And if we haven't made that, that place of recognition, that choice in our own lives, perhaps today will be that day for us, that we'll come to grips with the truth, that as we've just sang, Jesus is the way. ask you to bless our pastor as he, as he gets ready in his heart and in his mind, grant him strength for the next couple of hours to stand and declare the truth even in uh, his semi-incapacitated state. He's sick.
Lord, we're grateful for his courage to grant him uh, what he needs for these hours. And help us to be attentive to your spirit's call. We give you praise in the matchless name of Jesus. Amen. Pastor Herb mentioned I'm not feeling the best, so we're not going to do any handshakes and hugs today. <laughs> Elbow bumps maybe, but that's, uh, that's about the extent of it. And uh, I know that there's some more people that are here, or, or maybe even at home, that uh, aren't feeling so great. Yeah, but we'll just pray we all feel better soon, right? That's what we'll pray. Grab your programs if you would, please. Uh, follow along for the message for today. Uh, small series on 2020 vision and uh
you want to do the fill in the blanks, grab that pen as well. Uh, today we want to answer the question, do we want to see Jesus? Do we want to see Jesus? The Apostle Paul, a man who first persecuted the church of Christ, but then had a dramatic change take place in his life as he met Christ in a blinding light and a booming voice from heaven, wrote these words to one of the churches that uh, he helped to establish. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised the Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. I pray that the eyes of your heart might be enlightened. That's kind of our focus over the next several weeks. And for today, we need to look at the fact that we need greater insight into our lives than what our five senses can give us. We need greater insight in our lives than what we can see, what we can hear, what we can taste, what we can smell, what we can touch. I'm not talking about trying to develop a sixth sense, you know, an ESP kind of a thing. No, we need to know the hope that the Lord God gives us in Christ Jesus. And if I had to sum up that hope in one word, it would be life. That in Christ Jesus, our Heavenly Father guarantees life for us in this world and in the next. Eternal life, abundant life, purpose-filled life, life filled with meaning. Life in relationship with a God who made us and loves us and gave himself for us. And life then in connection with one another. We need that kind of insight into our lives. We need to experience the Lord's glorious riches and his incomparably great power. What's it say there? For us. For us. The very same authority that raised Christ Jesus from the dead is the power that by his spirit Christ un is unleashing in our lives right here and right now. We need to understand that. We need insight into that. We need to allow God, our Savior and Lord, to have his way in our lives. Indeed, if we're going to experience the hope and know the glorious riches and experience the power God has for us in our lives through Christ, there's some truths that we must believe. Did you notice that? His incomparably great power for us who believe, that defines who us is. There's some things we need to believe. I put down six things truths. There's many others that we are called to believe. We're all sinners. Our sin separates us from God. We're unable to solve our problem with sin. Jesus alone can save us. Jesus is our only hope, my friends, and that we can live in God's presence because of Christ here and now in every moment of every day. Now, if we're going to believe those truths, it means we're going to have our lives shaped by the one who is the truth, who is Christ Jesus. Believing is more than saying, okay, check it off the list. No, it needs to transform who we are each and every day. In Christ, God's Bible teaches us that our Heavenly Father does for us in him what we could never do for ourselves. He reestablishes a relationship between us and him. And we could never give that to ourselves. Could never earn it, never buy it, never do anything in order to have that. But he offers that freely to us in Christ Jesus. With that in mind, I find here in, in God's Bible that Jesus, our Savior and Lord, wants to work wondrously in our daily lives. He wants to work wondrously majestically, miraculously in our daily lives. He wants to let us know that he is indeed with us each moment of every day. He wants us to know without a doubt that he is walking with us and before us and behind us and next to us as we make our way through whatever is happening in our lives. 
God's Bible tells us that Jesus is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. But how often, my friends, are we disappointed with the Lord because he doesn't give us what we want? I'm probably not the only one in the room who feels that way. We pray and we pray and we pray and we think, this is the answer, Lord. This is exactly what you need to do and how you need to do it and when you need to do it. And then he doesn't. And at times we get discouraged, disappointed, disillusioned, I don't know. But he's able to do far more than we ask or imagine. Maybe we only see a little bit of the possibilities of what God can do in our lives or in the lives of others when there's a vast expanse that we're unaware of. How many times after the fact we've seen the hand of God at work in our lives and he's done something completely different than what we could have ever asked for? He wants to work wondrously in our lives, but it's going to be according to his timetable and according to his desires and according to who he is and him doing what's best for us in our lives. I think in some ways for us to recognize the wondrous ways in which he wants to work in our lives, we need to kind of let go of our lives and let, con let go of the control of our lives and allow him to be the Lord that he really is. And as we do that, as we follow Christ Jesus, he promises that he will fill our lives with his Holy Spirit. That indeed, we are gifted the very presence of God himself. We read this truth especially in John chapter 14, verses 15 through 17. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and to be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. As we choose to journey with Jesus and receive God's forgiving love offered only in Christ, we open our lives up to the gift who is the Holy Spirit to be what? to live with us and to be within us, transforming us and helping us to become who God wants us to be, opening our lives to God's wondrous work in our lives. And perhaps we notice it the most in the difficult places of our lives. Imagine the promise that God is making to us. He's promising himself to people like us. Talk about going back to the garden. perfect place in God's presence where our ancient ancestors could walk with God in the cool of the evening. I picture him strolling along having just kind of a conversation about all sorts of things and enjoying being in the very presence of God. Too often we forget that God offers himself to us in such a magnificent manner as this. Then it causes some problems for us, doesn't it? What we need, my friends, is 2020 spiritual foresight. We need 2020 spiritual foresight. We're told proverbially that only hindsight is 2020. It's that idea that it's easier for us to understand things after they've happened. We kind of go, the duh, of course it is, right? Once it's already happened, we look at it and go, oh, all right, that was go what's going on. But we need to look forward in our journey with Christ Jesus, not merely looking back. It's good for us to know our past, to know our history, to know where we've been, to see where the hand of God has been at work in our lives and in the lives of other people. I'm not saying we shouldn't understand something about our past and how God is working in the present that we're living in right now, but we need to have a forward glance as the people of God in Christ Jesus. Because if, if we live only looking back, 
that we're going to be plagued by the, what I put here in the program, coulda, shoulda, wouldas of life. If we're only going to look back and not look forward and follow after Christ Jesus as he moves forward, we're always going to look at our lives and say, I could have done better. I should have known better. I would have done this instead of that. And the could have, should have, would have of life can be very paralyzing for us. As we follow Christ and in the everyday things of our lives, we need that 2020 spiritual foresight to look for God in our present and beyond to follow after him. The Apostle Paul once again writes to a church when he writes these words, Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of fully knowing Christ. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. What might that goal be? I think simply to become like Christ Jesus himself. To become like our Lord and Savior. To have the foresight to see that he wants to transform who we are. And he will do that step by step as we make our ways through life. But we've got to be looking forward, not just back. What's that saying about the reason between the, why the rear view mirror in our car is so small and the windshield is so big? It's because we're supposed to spend most of our time looking forward instead of back. Makes sense. Now, Jesus is our leader. And it may be obvious, maybe not, that Jesus is up front as he leads us. He is up front. As he leads us. Indeed, God's Bible describes how God in Christ goes before us, how he is behind us to protect us from behind, and why, how he is on either side of us. It's the idea that he surrounds us by his spirit in the everyday things of our lives. But we want to focus on the fact that he's up front as he leads us. I have this passage from Exodus chapter 13 that illustrates how the Lord God worked with his Old Testament people, leading them up front. By day, the Lord went ahead of his people in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light so that they could travel by day or night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. Now, we might look at our lives and say, well, it would be easy to follow Jesus if he would kind of show up with the pillars like this. Right? If there was some kind of thing in the middle of the night, this is where you should go, that's the way you should go, here's where you stay, you know, here's the choice that you need to make. We say it would be easy, right? Easier than what we... No, it's not. We have it easier in a sense. Because we've been given, as I said earlier, the very presence of God himself. We've been granted the Holy Spirit of God to be with us and within us moment by moment and day by day. And by his presence, he enables us to follow after Christ. To know when to zig and when to zag. To know when to stop, to stay, to know when to move. To know how to decide. He grants us himself to help us in our daily living. Indeed, we're simply commanded to follow the leader. Earlier, I read from John chapter 14, verse 15. It says, if you love me, keep my commands. Obedience is key. If we want to know how God is leading us by Christ, by his spirit, we need to be obedient to the truth that we already know. How can we know what's the next step to be if we're not going to follow him with this step right here and right now? If we're going to follow his leading. It means to follow in his footsteps, right? Again, I picture a, a child following after an adult in like knee-deep snow. The adult goes first, right? Puts the footprints in the snow. Be mindful of the child so you don't go too far with a stride. And the child can step in those footprints. 
That's what Christ does for us, my friends, as he goes ahead of us, he's up front of us, as he leads us. I believe that we can look forward to what is next in our lives as we journey with the one who holds our future in his hand. Do we really want to know what's around the next bend? Do we really want to know what's going to happen in July of this year? Do we really want to know when some of us would say yes? I think it might be better to know him who has July of this year in his hands, who has the next thing going on in our lives in his hands, who has us in his hands where we get to see him. So that's the question we finish with today, the same one we started with. 2020 vision. Do we want to see Jesus? Do we want to see Jesus in the everyday things of our lives? Do we want the eyes of our hearts to be enlightened, to be open, to see how God is at work, how much Christ loves us, how the Father wants to draw us to himself. In John chapter 12, verse 20 through 22, we have this little story tucked in there. And here's how it reads. Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to Andrew Andrew and Philip, in turn, told Jesus. Now, this takes place near the end of Jesus' earthly ministry. And that's it as far as these Greeks, these non-Jews wanting to see Jesus. We're not told if Jesus grants them an audience, so to speak, or if they go away disappointed. I can't see him going away disappointed. In my head, in my heart, I believe Jesus had an encounter with these people. But it led Jesus into a discourse, if you look at John chapter 12, about his mission to give himself for all persons, for the entire world, and to individualize that loving care for each and every person who's ever lived, including each and every one of us. What drew them to want to see Jesus? Was it curiosity? What were the stories they heard? What were the miracles that they were made aware of? as they made the trek from who knows where. We would like to see Jesus. We'd like to see Jesus. Is that our desire, my friends? Is that what we want? To see Jesus? To know that he's with us? To know the hope he's called to us to? To experience the riches of his glorious inheritance, to know the incomparable greatness of his power for us. Is that what we want? Is that what we want? Grab your connection cards, if you would, please. Because maybe one of these next steps makes sense for you at this time in your spiritual journey. Maybe you want to explore the truths from God's Bible. You notice the page numbers in the program here. They correspond to the Bibles we use here. If you want to grab a Bible so you can quickly and easily find these truths or start to read somewhere else, grab a Bible and take it with you. Maybe today we want to start journeying with Jesus for the first time and to receive his forgiving love. It's a great first step right here and right now. I want to continue following Christ as my Savior, Lord, and leader every day. I'd like to think that the idea of Lord definitely would include him being our leader, but I wanted to highlight that for us today. So I ask that you pray for me as I'm praying with you and the next steps and other requests that you're making. And then as our prayer team prays on Wednesday night for all of us. Another step I think we can take is to pray each morning, please let me see you, Jesus. Every morning as we're getting ready to face whatever the day is, Maybe if we uttered a simple prayer, please let me see you, Jesus. Maybe we'd see him then more often in the things that are transpiring in our daily lives. I'm also planning to be here next Sunday for 2020 Vision, Behold the Lamb of God. Maybe you will choose to be here as well 
And there's also a blank line there. If the Lord's giving you a special step he wants you to take, please jot something down there, if you will. In a couple of moments, Lori and Keith are coming around with some baskets. They'll be receiving the financial gifts we bring to support God's work through open arms. But most importantly, they're collecting our connection cards. So please, my friends, prayerfully take at least one next step in your spiritual journey. And then please place your connection card along with any giving in one of those baskets. Lord, help us to see you, and as we see you, remake us into who you want us to be. As we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Remember this coming week that Jesus loves you. Remember that Jesus likes you. 
Remember that Jesus wants you. And that Jesus wants to hang out with you. So let him do it. And let's live life this coming week in the very presence of God. Thank you very much for choosing to be here today.